Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Rozier. I'm the director of the Albert LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and a member of the Villanova History Department faculty. Welcome to this special event on the theme of speculative fiction and historical perspective. And a special welcome to our distinguished panelists from Rosinus and Villanova and our distinguished moderator, Dr. Magan Keda. I must say that it's great to be in here in person at a live event instead of the many Zoom webinars that we've been having, which serve a purpose, but this is, this is better. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge Albert LePage's vision and generosity, which allowed us to establish the center in 2017. I also want to remind you to put your cell phones in nap time. And I want to encourage you to attend the LePage Center's final two events of the fall semester. Next Thursday, the 16th, we will offer our third session on cities in historical perspective, this one focusing on the theme of public health in port cities. And on Tuesday, December 15th, December 5th, we'll close the semester program with a special event, something a little bit different, video games in historical perspective which will explore how video games reflect the creative impulses of a historical era. Uh, the event, that event will be moderated by Gordon Coonfield of Villanova's Communications Department. Both of these events are virtual, begin at 6 p.m. and require advanced registration. To register for those events, just visit the LePage Center homepage. Also stay tuned for announcements of spring semester events which will continue the theme of cities in historical perspective, as well as include special events on Ukraine, baseball in historical perspective, and many other important and interesting topics. Finally, I want to thank Kevin Fox, the LePage Center's administrator, for conceiving and organizing tonight's event. And accordingly, I invite him to introduce our three panelists and moderators. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Paul. Um, so first off, I'd like to thank um, our co-sponsors and collaborators in the English Department, uh, Global Interdisciplinary Studies, and Africana Studies uh, for help organizing tonight's event. And um, with that, I'll introduce our speakers. Uh, first, our moderator, Dr. Magan Keda, is Professor of History and Global Interdisciplinary Studies at Villanova and the founding director of both the Institute for Global Interdisciplinary Studies and the Africana Studies program at Villanova University. Keda's Race and the Writing of History, Riddling the Sphinx, received the 13th Annual Cheik Anta Diop Award for Best Scholarly Book. He is editor of Conceptualizing, Reconceptualizing Africa, The Construction of African Historical Identity, and author of A Political Economy of Healthcare in Senegal. Uh, former chair of the Board of Trustees of the College Board, Dr. Keda is also editor-in-chief for Africa for the Journal of Asian African Studies, and author of a number of scholarly publications. Um, to my immediate right, Dr. Heather Hicks is Professor of English and Chair of the English Department at Villanova University. She is author of the post-apocalyptic novel in the 21st century, uh, Modernity Beyond Salvage, and has published a number of recent book chapters and articles on contemporary apocalyptic fiction, exploring themes including disaster response, extinction, and the pernicious myth of the femme fatale. Dr. Travis Foster is Academic Director of Gender and Women's Studies and Associate Professor of English at Villanova University. Most recently, he is the author of Genre and White Supremacy in the Post-Emancipation United States, editor of The Cambridge Companion to American Literature and the Body, and co-editor of Americans write, American Women's Writing and the Genealogy of Queer Thought, a special issue of Legacy. His articles are forthcoming in Transgender Studies Quarterly and The Cambridge Companion to American Literature and Race. Dr. Patricia Ann Lott is an Associate Professor of English, African American, and Africana Studies and American Studies at Her Sinus College, where she teaches courses on African American literature, orature, and performance. Her research interrogates the problems of racial slavery, incomplete emancipation, and unfinished abolition in the late 18th through turn of the 20th century North as discerned in the region's laws and its literary, oratorial, performance, and visual cultures. Uh, let's give a hand to our esteemed panelists. 
let me just get this set up. Uh, uh. Kevin? This isn't tracking over there. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, so I want to start tonight with a word about the term speculative fiction, since one might wonder, isn't all fiction speculative? After all, every work of fiction takes a premise and imagines actions and events unfolding from it. However, as critic Merrick Ozewicz has, has detailed, the science fiction writer Robert Heinlein um, popularized the term speculative fiction in the 1940s to allude to a special subset of science fiction that was especially concerned with the human experience of technology rather than technology itself. The term has continued to evolve, and at this point, speculative fiction usually refers to a wide array of literature that depicts alternative realities of the past and present and possible versions of the future. My own recent scholarship concerns a subset of speculative fiction that imagines events that destroy human society or a large portion of it, a genre that is usually described as apocalyptic fiction. It's a useful time to reflect on the uh, history of this area of speculative fiction because it has a central ro role to play in our current climate crisis. Human life has always involved uncertainty, but as alarms are sounding about the visceral impacts of human-made climate change, Fiction writers in ever greater numbers are speculating about the future of the planet and how we might best negotiate the changes before us. Tonight I want to sketch out the continuities between the early tradition of apocalyptic fiction and the genre called climate fiction uh, and conclude by identifying some areas where climate fiction has departed from these historical origins. When thinking about the history of apocalyptic literature, I always like to begin with an insight I gleaned from Warren Wagar in his excellent book called Terminal Visions. He points out that humans have been predicting the end of human society since there were human societies. As Wagar demonstrates, one can trace the line of apocalyptic mythology from ancient Babylon to prehistoric Greece to Rome and from ancient India and China as well. Wegar persuasively argues that the unifying themes in all early end-of-the-world mythology were corruption, immorality, and greed. These ancient peoples understood their societies to be in terminal decline and anticipated their imminent annihilation. To that, I will just say some things never change. In works like Octavia Butler's 1993 novel Parable of the Sower and Margaret Atwood's 2001 novel Oryx and Crake, both of which are now viewed as important pioneering instances of climate fiction, these writers depict the world being ravaged by neoliberal corruption and greed. Among literary historians, the next step in the evolution of the apocalyptic tradition is usually understood to be the Christian formulation of the end times, expressed in the book of Revelation. The final book of the Bible prophecies a day of judgment in which sinners will wind up burning forever, while the chosen will go to a bejeweled, light-suffused paradise known as the New Jerusalem. Critics like Catherine Keller have persuasively made the case that Revelation's vision has deeply shaped Western, Western culture. Certainly one sees an intense preoccupation with moral judgment in recent climate fiction. In novels like Lydia Millet's A Children's Bible, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> the Children's Bible, Millet depicts a group of hapless, self-indulgent parents who recklessly consume while a childlike, a Christ-like child, Jack, must suffer the environmental collapse caused by their sins. Meanwhile, many contemporary novels by writers like T.C. Boyle offer exquisite passages of nature writing that imply that practices of environmental conservation will guarantee a new Jerusalem here on Earth. When it comes to the emergence of apocalyptic fiction, 
that is, imaginative works of prose rather than myth or theology, we have to jump forward in time to the early 1800s and a number of influential works that have come to be known as the last man tradition. These texts portray a single man, and yes, it was always a man, who survives a plague or astronomical disaster that kills everyone except for him. The most famous example of this fiction is Mary Shelley's novel called The Last Man, which was published in 1826. Shelley depicts a global plague that gradually kills every human on Earth except for a lone survivor, Lionel Verney. Shelley, who famous suffered many personal tragedies in her life, including the death of several of her children and the drowning of her husband, offers a moving account of the profound emotional impact of the plague as Verney experiences the loss of one loved one after another, including his young children. A number of recent works of climate fiction have similarly focused on the domestic impacts of climate change and climate anxiety, including Kara Spray's 2020 novel, When the Lights Go Out, and Boyle's 2023 novel, Blue Skies. Critic Adeline Johns Putra has pointed out that in trying to make people today care about the future, climate activists and policymakers continually mobilize images of children. Similarly, novels like Gray's and Boyle's focus on children and the terrible costs they will pay if climate change and climate, sorry, if climate actions aren't taken swiftly and decisively. While Shelley lived and wrote in England, some of the first apocalyptic fiction in the US was written in the 1830s and 1840s by well-known writers like Edgar Allan Poe and Nathaniel Hawthorne. In 1839, Poe published one of the earliest apocalyptic narratives with an astronomical theme with the story, The Conversation of Eros and Charmian, in which a comet strikes the earth. While Shelley created intimate domestic scenes of loss, Poe attempts to capture the emotional state of whole societies as they reckon with the looming comet. We live in a time when this theme could not be more urgent. Scholars have documented the degree to which the contemporary public at large in the US and elsewhere denies or ignores the climate data provided by scientists. Perhaps the most sweeping work of fiction to explore this topic is Kim Stanley Robinson's 2020 novel, Ministry for the Future, in which he speculates on what level of public climate disruption it will take to spark a meaningful international response. Seven years after Poe's story appeared, Nathaniel Hawthorne published a political fable called Earth's Holocaust. In this work of satire, a wave of reformist zeal sweeps the young nation, and men and women start a giant bonfire into which they throw all sources of corruption, from alcohol to weapons, and even some suspect religious materials. At the conclusion of the story, the devil, who has been a bystander throughout, assures several scoff laws that evil will prevail since no one has thrown away the ultimate source of corruption, the human heart. While Hawthorne's relationship to Puritanism was complicated, this story channels the misanthropy of a belief system that saw all humans as tainted by sin. That view of humans as a problem is another thread that appears in contemporary climate fiction. Works like Boyle's A Friend of the Earth and Atwood's Oryx and Crake entertain the idea that the best answer to climate change is eliminating humans. Moving back across the Atlantic, an English nature writer, Richard Jeffrey's 1885 novel, After London, he's vague about why England's population has died off. Yet the toxicity of the remains of London hint to human causes. The beginning of his novel lays out the ecological effects of this depopulation in great detail. Jeffrey imagines the specific ways the environment and various animal species would be transformed in the absence of human influence. We can see in Jeffrey's work a desire to educate readers about the natural world that also appears in contemporary climate fiction. In particular, I see a connection between Jeffrey's work and Barbara Kingsolver's celebrated 2012 novel, Flight Behavior, which portrays an annual migration of monarch butterflies derailed by climate change. King Solver's novel ex includes extended scientific discussions of the habitat and biology of the butterflies. It also uses exquisite lyrical language to present them as magical and sublime. Staying in England, I want to briefly mention H.G. Wells' 1897 story, The Star, in which a star is created by a collision in space and heads toward the Earth. 
Like Poe, Wells effectively portrays how populations across the globe react to the imminent disaster, and again, they kind of deny, and then they gradually believe. Yet what is especially striking is that Wells treats what he calls scientific people with reverence, offering an extended scene in which a mathematician accurately computes the star's deadly trajectory. We see that respect for and promotion of science in many of the contemporary works of climate fiction. Finally, I want to come back to the US and backtrack slightly to 1889 with John Ames Mitchell's 1889 novella, The Last American. Mitchell's work may be the first that specifically imagines, quote, frightful climate, climatic changes as the source of destruction, describing wild swings of heat and cold that, quote, swept the country like a mower's scythe. In Mitchell's work, America ceased to exist as a nation in 1990, and Persians conduct an expedition to North America in 2951 to explore the ruins. In explaining America's collapse, the novella expresses racist views of immigrants that were commonplace in the period. The text suggests that robust white Americans might have carried on in the face of climate change, but the constitutionally weaker immigrants depleted America's fortitude, ultimately leaving the US all but empty of population. Unfortunately, racist discourse appears in other of the texts I've described here. In Mary Shelley's novel, blame for the global plague is attached to Muslims. Hawthorne gives his devil dark skin. And Jeffries associates gypsies, the Irish, and Scots with barbarism. In this regard, there is a distinct historical shift between these foundational works and contemporary climate fiction. While the writers from the 19th century that I've just discussed were all white, writers of color, including Octavia Butler, Shang Ray Lee, Louise Erdrich, Sherry Dimoline, and Omar el Akkad, have produced important instances of climate fiction examining the impact of climate change on communities of color. A second important distinction between pre-20th century American, excuse me, pre-20th pre century apocalyptic fiction and its latest expression in climate fiction is the way some contemporary writers, especially Kim Stanley Robinson in novels like The Ministry for the Future, are attempting to offer both policy approaches and technological solutions that could help us avoid worst case scenarios. So to conclude, when we look at early instances of apocalyptic fiction, we see a number of themes and concerns that climate fiction writers are continuing to leverage, including social critiques of greed and corruption, moral judgment alongside the possibility of redemption, depictions of personal suffering with special attention to the endangerment of children, considerations of how whole societies respond to a global threat, misanthropic portraits of humans as fundamentally evil or destructive, celebrations of nature and its beauty and complexity, and a valorization of scientists as potential heroes. Meanwhile, a new focus on environmental justice is redressing the racism that was once so common in apocalyptic versions of speculative fiction. And in the face of the slow violence of climate change, new writers are doing the best sort of speculating, which is imagining futures of hope. Thank you. Thank you so much to the LePage Center. Thanks so much to Kevin for all the organizing work and thanks to my co-panelists. I'm really happy to be here today. So um, Dr. Keda sent us three questions. What does speculative fiction mean to you? How do you interpret the modifier speculative? How do you conceive of speculative fiction and historical um, perspective? And what is the role of speculative fiction or speculation beyond this historical or the historical? And I want to address these questions in two ways. So first, by speaking to the definition of speculative fiction and the forms taken by the speculation in speculative fiction through the question of genre, which has been a focus of my research for the past many years. And second, I want to think about the relationship between history and speculative fiction by exploring the case study of Martin R. Delaney's novel, Blake or the Huts of America, 
published serially between 1861 and 1862. This is a novel imagining a future in which through a militant and collective revolution of the formerly enslaved, Cuba becomes a self-governed black state and precipitates not only the downfall of slavery throughout North America, but also hemispheric black liberation. Genres are the interfaces between readers and fiction. We pick up a new literary fiction or romance or fantasy novel. When we do that, we come with expectations that shape our experience and impact the meaning we discover. Genres are also interpret and kind of help writers think about what sorts of aspirations they have and what possibilities they bring to their fiction. Many different subgenres fall under the broader category of speculative fiction, and I'm working with the kind of definition that Heather brought up that broadens um, as we get closer to the present. So space romances, generation ship adventures, alt histories, post-apocalyptic narratives, cli-fi, urban fantasy, epic fantasy, high fantasy. But by and large, we tend to approach speculative fiction when we go to the bookstore through two broad categories, fantasy and science fiction. In fantasy, the stories frequently take place in imaginative, otherworldly settings, such as magical realms, where characters possess extraordinary powers or abilities. These settings and abilities cater to the readers or the protagonists fantasies and desires, right? We come to Harry Potter because we desire to be a wizard rather than a muggle. Science fiction, on the other hand, is often characterized by its use of thought experiments that are grounded in scientific principles. It frequently delves into what-if scenarios that speculate on the consequences of scientific and technological advancements. Science fiction stories might ask questions like, what if humans could time travel? Or what if we encountered extraterrestrial life? We bring to fantasy our desires about what the world might be, severed from the rules of reality in favor of a more whimsical and magical place. We bring to science fiction our questions about what might be possible at the boundaries of scientific knowledge and the implications of future advancements. These are crude distinctions, and if, like me, you're an avid reader of both science fiction and fantasy novels, you probably already have in mind a handful of counterexamples and crossovers. But there are also distinctions that help pinpoint what speculative fictions of a certain age or population might reveal, underscoring how speculative fiction doesn't merely anticipate technological innovations and their potential consequences, but also invites fantasy about what life might be like were it completely otherwise, with worlds, technologies, and societies that transcend the limitations of reality itself. How speculative fiction doesn't merely raise ethical questions about the consequences of scientific progress and of playing God, right? We can think of Mary Shelley's, Shelley's Frankenstein, but also presents us with worlds in which the race, gender, and power dynamics challenge the reigning status quo. Um, we can think here of Naomi Alderman's recent novel, The Power. To study speculative fiction in history is to study the futures of the past, those trajectories that any given era imagined, feared, and desired, those potentialities that were foreseen but by and large never came to pass. Speculative fiction embraces the fictionality of fiction. It leans into fiction's invitation to imagine otherwise, and through such imagination, to fantasize about and quite literally plot roots to worlds that are organized otherwise. So bringing this to my case study, I want to first contrast two texts, both published in 1861. My case study, Blake or the Huts of America, which is often described as the first black science fiction novel, and Harriet Jacobs' nonfiction memoir, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Where contemporary readers often turn to Jacobs' narrative to learn how formerly enslaved, self-emancipated people understood their freedom, innovated techniques of resistance to slavery, and experimented with rhetorical modes capable of persuading white readers to adopt abolitionist worldviews. We read a speculative novel like Blake to understand how formerly enslaved, 
and free black people living before the Civil War envisioned modes of freedom far more expansive, far more radically severed from present realities than mere self-possession, self-ownership, than merely the absence of slavery. Contrasting Blake to a sentimental novel like Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin expands the distinction. Like Uncle Tom's Cabin, Blake was written in part responding to the 1850 passage of the Fugitive Slave Act. Unlike Stowe, however, Delaney isn't directing his narratives toward the sympathies of a white reading public. He has said wrote his speculative novel as a black narrative written to pique the curiosities and revolutionary interests of a black, and many critics argue, indigenous audience across Central America, North America, and the Caribbean. Complaining that Frederick Douglass has been too deferential to Harriet Beecher Stowe and her novel, Delaney writes, now I simply wish to say that we have always fallen into great efforts of this kind, going to others than the intelligent and experienced among ourselves. And in all due respect and deference to Mrs. Stowe, I beg leave to say that she knows nothing about us, the free colored people of the United States, neither does any other white person, and consequently can contrive no successful scheme for our elevation it must be done by ourselves. This claim in which Delaney aligns his own fictional efforts with the scheme for black elevation also positions his novel as speculative in two ways and expands, I think, our ideas about what the speculation in speculation, speculative fiction means. So on one, on one hand, it's the imaginative conjecture we typically associate with science fiction and fantasy narrative. And at the same time, DeLake is describing investment in schemes with the hope of gain, but the risk of loss that we associate with speculative trading. Blake is a novel that imagines how a massive and revolutionary movement for collective black self-emancipation might progress that through such a kind of radical imagining aims to convince its black readers, free and enslaved, to invest their futures in precisely such a scheme, risky but with the potential for massive returns, speculating about and speculating in. In my remaining short amount of time, I want to expand somewhat on what more precisely that looks like in this one novel. The novel follows its protagonist, the eponymous Blake, after he has been roused to action against the institution of slavery following the sale of his wife and son. His quest for justice takes him across the United States, Canada, West Africa, and Cuba, exploring the global tentacles of the slave trade and subverting them by establishing a transnational network of black revolutionaries. The novel was first published serially in two black newspapers, the Afro uh, the Af Ang Af Anglo African and the Weekly Anglo African. And frustratingly, the final chapter, the final issues of the newspapers where, in which the novel were published haven't been found at this point. So readers are, contemporary readers are left sort of suspended about whether or not that revolutionary effort described in the novel is ultimately successful. But what we do have opens a history of black thought unavailable in either realism or in narratives aspiring to persuade white audiences. What that looks like in Blake is, I think, nothing short of astounding. Blake calls for the abolition of not just slavery, but also the supremacy of white feelings. It envisions the possibility of a new world made possible through black and indigenous organizing. It envisions the construction of a fugitive science, a highly experimental, itinerant set of practices and tools mobilized in the freedom struggle of both enslaved and nominally free peoples, a science located in the huts of America rather than its laboratories. It offers a panoramic view of slavery, inviting readers to speculate in the potential futures made possible through wide-scale, hemispheric collective action, reframing resistance as plural and multivocal. 
It interrogates new geographies, looking south instead of north for freedom. Geographies in which Cuba, Central, and South America promise more complete modes of freedom than those formerly enslaved people would find in the racist climes of either Canada or the North American or the Northern United States. It presents black futurity as a practice rather than a promise, as something to be fought for and won rather than received. And finally, Blake sets a precedent for the creation of radical heroes, radical organizations, and radical practices seeking to end black subjugation that critics trace from Blake through the works of post-Reconstruction writers like Sutton Griggs and Pauline Hopkins, through 20th century writers like W.E.B. Du Bois, Octavia Butler, and Samuel Delaney, all the way to 2018's blockbuster film, Black Panther. So Jacob's, that's kind of my concluding statement, um, Jacob's Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl was read by thousands more readers than Delaney's Blake. And Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin was read by hundreds of thousands more readers than Martin Delaney's Blake. And for good reasons, these are the two of the kind of literary texts that historians, Americanist historians, most frequently mention when describing the 19th century, especially the antebellum 19th century. But to write a history of an era without that era's speculative fictions is to write an incomplete history, one that leaves out the imaginings, the fictions that speak not only to how any given era thinks of its own moment, but also to the aspirations, dreams, and fears it directs toward its future. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> okay, so good evening, everyone. I'd first like to extend a very heartfelt thank you to Dr. Keda for inviting me to the panel and for Kevin for all of his administrative and organizational labors in bringing us here tonight. And last but not least, my panelists and to you, our audience, for being here to learn more about speculative fiction. So I'll begin as well um, with a discussion of what speculative fiction is. And to preface that discussion, I'll say a little bit about the conditions under which texts and the genres to which we assign them come into existence. And literary scholars refer to this as the rhetorical situation. So the rhetorical situation has a number of different components, including the writer, and that writer's own biography, as well as their social and political positioning in any given society, whether it's their race, their nationality, their gender and sex, et cetera, um, shapes their work. The purpose for which writers write is also important for thinking about rhetorical situation. The topic or subject of a writer's text. And then the broader context, and context includes time, place, space, location, right? So historical context would be an important consideration to think about in terms of the rhetorical situation. So I outline all of this because you may be shocked to know that scholars do not agree on the definition of speculative fiction. I know, shocking, right? Um, but um, the rhetorical situation, in addition to shaping individual texts, also has something to do with how people think of and name genres. So um, when we're thinking about speculative fiction, um, as Heather pointed out, scholars generally attribute the genre's name to Robert Heinlein, who wrote an essay in 1947 titled On the Writing of Speculative Fiction. And 
Speculative fiction intends to depart from the commercialism and the expectation of formulaic predictability of science fiction in its golden age. So if you think about the 1950s, I don't know how many of you all have seen some of those science fiction pulps that printed on like that kind of cheap paper with the really, really cheesy images like of aliens and um, humans trying to escape some type of alien invasion or maybe some type of technological torture, right? Um, so, Speculative fiction attempted to distinguish itself from that. And so you have writers, readers, publishers, and other such ent um, entities who are looking for a higher degree of literary ambition. And they are less concerned with attaining a high volume of sales and more with reaching a more highly educated, more artistically sophisticated and demanding audience. Okay, so that's just to say a little bit about the rhetorical situation in which speculative fiction arises. Now, and, and you can read more about this in John Ryder's What is SF? So when we're talking about speculative fiction and what it means to speculate, so speculation involves conjecture about what is beyond the here and now based on one's worldview of past and present circumstances. And when we're thinking about speculative fiction, particularly written narratives, they are imaginative narratives that conjecture about possible futures. And this can include science fiction, it can include, include fantasy and horror, as well as the, a range of genres um, named by um, Heather and Travis. And that is, um, generally speaking, speculative fiction. Uh, now there are a number of um, specific types of speculative fiction, of course, and a number of different modes of speculation. And one particular mode of speculation that I'm going to speak about now is called Afrofuturism, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. You've heard the name Octavia Butler um, uttered a couple of times tonight. She's considered the grand dame of uh, science fiction and Afrofuturism particularly. So Afrofuturism, um, the term came into being by Mark Derry in 1993 in this phenomenal interview that he did titled Black to the Future. And he interviewed Samuel Delaney, um, who's considered one of the literary forefathers of Afrofuturism, as well as Trisha Rose and Greg Tate, both of whom are cultural critics. And Derry defines Afrofuturism as speculative fiction that treats African-American themes that addresses African-American concerns in the context of 20th century technoculture. And he includes under his label, um, not only written texts like novels and short stories, but also comic books, music, and film. Right? And so I've added an image here of Erica Badu, the album cover for New America Part Two. Um, you can also, if you imagine Janelle Monet, right, <laughs> and her um, embodiment of an android, right? So um, a lot of hip hop and R&B artists also take up this mantle of the Afrofuturist. So in terms of thinking about the uh, rhetorical situation of Afrofuturism, particularly historical context, it is important to note um, that it comes out of the conditions of European colonial modernity and racial slavery and colonization. And so you have someone like Toni Morrison who argues that enslaved people were the first moderns. And what she means by this is when we consider a lot of the attributes that scholars would attach to what it means to be a modern subject, um, including dislocation and alienation. Enslaved people were the first to experience, enslaved Africans were the first to experience this, and in its most extreme forms, okay? And so the ways in which a lot of enslaved and um, slave-traded subjects describe their experiences often takes on what we might consider scientific, or uh, excuse me, social, uh, scientific, or um, science fictional elements. And so has anyone in here read Alado Equiana's narrative, for example? Okay, if you've read it, then there's this moment, um, it's written by Alado Equiano, and he's narrating the moment in which he's kidnapped from West Africa. And the way that he talks about European enslavers, it's kind of like um, an alien encounter, right? And as if he were an alien abduct abductee. So he talks about their slave ships as if they were almost floating in air, right? Because he had never seen the sea before. He didn't know that they were on water. He describes them as these um, horrible looking men with their loose hair and their red faces. And he thinks that they're coming to eat him, right? 
Um, and so we can find many of those types of descriptions in slave narratives like Equiano's. So according to scholar Kwajo Eshin, um, in his essay, Future Considerations on Afro, or Further Considerations on Afrofuturism, Afrofuturism elaborates Toni Morrison's thesis that enslaved people were the first moderns. And so Greg Tate adds to this that being black in America is a science fiction experience. And again, he returns to those themes of alienation, of dislocation. Um, in addition to Tate, we also have uh, Juno Diaz in his novel, The Brief and Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, who has the protagonist um, when he's asking the question of what it means to be um, Antillian, right, um, to be Afro-Dominican, um, who more sci-fi than us, right? Which again points to how uh, people of African descent really, um, their experiences are profoundly science fictional in many ways. So I'll now go through a couple of speculative fiction novels that we might call Afrofuturist. And Travis mentioned Imperium in Imperio by Sutton E. Graves. And it's considered in many ways the literary descendant of Blake, or the Huts of Africa, um, as well as a literary ancestor to uh, the political ambitions and motivations of Pan-Africanists, uh, particularly Marcus Messiah Garvey. Um, in addition to uh, New Africans and their New African independence movement. So Imperium in Imperio really imagines a future in which African Americans establish an independent black nation state um, using Waco, Texas as its headquarters at the turn of the 20th century. And the reason why um, Griggs is writing is he's trying to imagine a future beyond uh, the violent domination and general dishonor of Jim Crow apartheid. And so um, Imperium and Imperio imagines what that might look like. The Comet is a short story by W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, it is set in the Jim Crow North in New York City. And it imagines that a comet strikes the city. And the protagonist, Jim, imagines that everyone in the city is dead. And is, as he's traveling, trying to find his wife and child, he encounters this white woman, Julia. And they're traveling through the city, um, looking at all of the destruction, the death. And um, eventually, towards the novel's end, they discover that everyone is not dead. And in fact, people, um, they're really, uh, Jim in particular is really afraid because when the crowd sees him with this white woman, um, they come, they yell, we should lynch him, right? And so the novel kinds, kind of ends there, but he does escape um, when he finds his wife and child. Then there's Black No More, a highly satirical novel written by George Shiler and published in 1931. And it features a scientist, a black scientist by the name of Junius Crookman, who creates a treatment by the name of Black No More, designed to turn black people white. And the treatment really resembles an electric chair. Um, and people line up in droves to get the treatment. And um, according to Crookman, the treatment is intended to solve the so-called Negro problem. And the Negro problem, according to white people um, in at the, this part of the century, is that the Negro was a problem, right? What to do with black people? If, if African Americans were brought to this country to be slaves, now that slavery is over, what should be done with them? And so Crookman presents this treatment as sort of a solution to that. Um, ultimately, he does turn out to be a trickster. Um, you'll have to read it, though, to figure out what his true ambitions are. So moving forward in the century, there's Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, which has also been adapted into a graphic novel. And this imagines protagonist Lauren Ol Olamina in a near apocalyptic United States um, trying to survive right, um, with her family and creating a new family in the midst of uh, the separation that she experiences from her own community. And we see some of the traces of the slavery past appear in this future because according to the protagonist, the new president wants to bring back slavery. And we also see a form of corporate slavery called debt slavery in the novel, where people go to these company towns. They're promised water, shelter, housing, food, right, um, in exchange for their labor. Thinking um, beyond the United States to the Caribbean and to Africa, 
Midnight Robber by Nalo Hopkinson is set in a far, far future on the planet of Toussaint, which is named after Toussaint and Louverture, um, leader of the Haitian Revolution of 1791 through 1804, um, in the galaxy of Garvey Prime, again named after Marcus Garvey. And it, it imagines the exploits of this young girl as she gets trapped in another time dimension and is separated from her family and she's trying to find her way back. And so it employs really a pan-Caribbean future. It's Jamaican Patois, Spanish, French, English, right? These are some of the languages Hop Hopkinson writes in. And she uses the mythology of the Caribbean in weaving the narrative, including the figure of the midnight robber, which is a carnival figure. Finally, we have Who Fears Death by Nettie Okorafor. And she is a Nigerian writer. And Who Fears Death features a protagonist, a young woman by the name of Anye, um, who has to overcome a number of different systemic challenges that seek to constrain her as a result of her sex. And in particular, she's a very powerful sorceress, but she can't get the training that she needs um, because people think you're just a girl, right? Um, this isn't for you. This art is reserved exclusively for men. Um, but she does end up getting the training and she seeks to rewrite what the novel describes as uh, the great book, which has condemned her people to genocide, um, as well as attempted to relegate women to a future of sexual violation. And um, I won't, again, spoil the ending, but she's really, really a feminist um, uh, futurist figure. So in conclusion, then, um, Afrofuturism conjectures about how science, technology, and race especially blackness, might appear in imagined futures that are shaped by unfinished pasts and unsettled presents. So again, um, colonization, racial slavery, Jim Crow, anti-black racism, these often feature in the works of Afrofuturist writers. And according to Eschen, an ultimate aim of Afrofuturism is to offer counter-futures that complement the counter-histories written by African and African-descended intellectuals, including historians. So Eschen argues that there is a thing called the futures industry, and it's really a capitalist corporate entity that attempts to shape how we think about the future through what he calls futuristic programming. So if you think about any of the movies that you've watched or the shows that you've seen, um, it, and the product placements, right, and the promise of different technologies, um, I have friends who still think they're going to get the hoverboards from Back to the Future. Right? Um, so the futures industry tries to prime us for a particular kind of future. And then when it comes to black people and the continent of Africa in particular, the future industry often predicts catastrophe, right? death and destruction. And so Eschen says the ultimate goal of Afrofuturists is to create a counter future to that future, right? one is the, that is more liberationist and, and hopeful, hopeful for Africans and their descendants. All right, thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Let, let's get to it then. I mean, this is some good stuff. Um, so one of the things that I'm impressed with, with the three, given that this is history in the public interest, I'm sorry, y'all, you literary people are up here. <laughs> but history in the public interest is that you've outlined basically a history of the genre, how we can trace the genre from early on and then place it into different spaces using your model to give us some interpretive sense about how different groups of people envision their future. But I need to go back to, um, to Travis's point about thinking about speculative fiction as the study of the future of the past. And how do, we, how do we deal with that in, in, in shaping what we see as speculative fiction and then the functions that speculative fiction might play for who we are in the here and now? Yeah, this is what I do with my students. <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't have a clear answer, and I'm going to be um, overly opaque in my response. 
But I think one of the things that happens in the lost futures of the past is that they never fully go away. So we are living in moments where, and I love this term, the future industry, where our present moment has been determined by the future industry of the past. But I think at the same time, those counter futures coexist inside of our present. And by going back to the past and thinking about the different counter futures envisioned at different moments in history, then we can also interrogate alternative realities, ways of being, ways of world making in our, in our present. I mean, I guess one thing I'll just return to as far as the past um, that are imagined in my little subgenre that I've been talking about is just the chronic belief about the world ending that is so ancient. You know, I, I mean, when I first read Wagar and I realized, right, we were talking about the very first human civilizations, and they already think everything is not totally to hell. Um, and how is that possible that we just rehearse that? version over and over again since there have been humans together in one place. Um, and maybe that, I find that hopeful, um, even as I take very seriously our current um, particular uh, conditions in the world, um, that that prediction has always been wrong so far. And I didn't even get to talk about, you know, the whole nuclear uh, era of science fiction, um, which, you know, is still ongoing to some degree, but that, that profound conviction that we were all going to blow ourselves up, it's still a possibility, but, um, you know, that we've navigated, I just feel like we should give ourselves a little credit here, that we're still here. <laughs> Trish? Well, I, um, very explicitly um, in Afrofuturism is um, this impulse, again, to think critically about the presence and the futures that the heinous histories of European colonialism and racial slavery have birthed. And you can see very explicitly in quite a few of the authors um, that they do indeed uh, read very interestingly some of their um, forebears, not just the fictional texts, but also slave narratives, speeches, where those historical figures are themselves speculating about what type of future um, black people might have, whether it's in the United States, the Caribbean, or Africa. And so in some instances, you may see black writers taking up those tropes. So people like Sutton Griggs, right, um, who could be considered an ancestor to uh, Martin Delaney. And taking a broad look at that past and the ambitions of black nationalism and pan-Africanism as they were in the mid-19th century. And then looking from his Jim apartheid present at the turn of the 20th century and imagining, given that past and this present, how can we get to a future of black liberation? Um, and so I think that, again, um, it's very explicit. And, the, and not all of the writers take it up this explicitly, right? Um, of course, you have people like Nalo Hopkinson for whom um, the future of the past of the Haitian Revolution is a whole black planet, right? Named after someone like Toussaint. Um, L Overture. Um, and for others like Shiler, um, it's a very nihilistic future, one in which blackness will cease to exist. And, um, but racism does not, and anti-black racism does not, very interestingly. You have to read the novel. Promise you, you will be captivated. Um, and so in some instances for people like Shiler, that past is a changing same. Right? Um, and so even though the, the um, particular acts and institutions through which anti-black racism um, and genocide get expressed may be different. Um, the system remains intact. For others, there's a radical break with that past of subjection in which um, the revolutionary aspects of black history live on into the future. So uh, it's very, very strong that, that um, the study of the future of the past and Afrofuturist writers. So thinking about um Taking up Heather's point, and what does, um, for each of you, what do we learn when we escape the apocalypse? I mean, <laughs> have we learned anything? Are we learning anything from escaping the apocalypse? 
That means you ask hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like your students here. Um, I, I mean, I think some... There's an awareness within some of this more contemporary work right, um, of these longer traditions and uh, pressure against them in different forms, whether again, as I mentioned, whether it's you know more contemporary writers very consciously writing about racial um, you know justice and environmental justice, or um, you know trying to think about modes of literary form that could assist us in dodging some of the crises that have already been experienced. Um, while also thinking all about new forms that might, you know, help us dodge potential issues down the road. Um, you know, I, I think there is a self-awareness, and maybe in all of these, this is the kind of writing where I think the re their writers are readers in a really passionate way about these traditions, and so they are in dialogue with big swaths of this. I mean, I'm so excited to hear about some more books to read. Um, yeah, so they're learning from those earlier works. Not solving everything, though. That's my answer. So, not solving everything. I'm, I'm thinking about um, this notion that we see in a lot of fiction about the parallel dimensions. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we might think about this, uh, if we thought about this strictly in the sense of being in the United States of America and we talk about the two or three or four Americas, I mean, can we make that connection here? And I'm thinking about it in one sense, um, having read um, William Gibson's last two pieces, uh, Perennial and Agency, mm -hmm. in which what we're looking at there are questions of parallel notions what, of what has come of an apocalyptic moment. And so what do we, how do we, what do we translate? How, what kinds of skills might, in fact, the readers of speculative fiction gain from looking at these kinds of dynamics? And then what kinds of practices might come from them? I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm going to be, I, like, very simply, I think um, Emily Dickinson describes hope as, like, the bird that lives inside of us, and I think speculative fiction can give us the bird. <laughs> Some people wonder which bird it is. <laughs> It's very interesting that you talk about the, the skills that readers might gain from looking at the types of dynamics that speculative fiction um, narrates. Um, and I think we see a number of different skills coming into play. Um, in some instances, they're the very practical skills of survival. Um, my students love reading Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower for this reason. Um, they pay very close attention. We have a lot of discussion about, okay, what are the, the means of self-defense, right, that we see uh, the people in this future America taking up, um, given the fact that um, there's a lot of violence. Um, what does Lauren Olamina keep in her bug out bag, as we would call it, right, or her bag that when, you know, shit hits the fan, right, and she has to go quickly, what does she keep in that? And um, what are the books that she's reading, right, about how to treat diseases with medicinal herbs? Um, about how to wrap different wounds, et cetera. So um, I found it interesting that my students are often draw drawn to those very particular practical skills about what life might look like day to day um, in uh, an apocalyptic future in this instance um, and how they could navigate that um, with the objective of survival in mind. I think another skill um, that speculative fiction gives particularly that of science fiction, um, with its trope of cognitive estrangement, um, which is the, the process by which 
authors will give you some very benign description of the world that's very familiar to you as a reader. So you might imagine um, that you know two characters are walking along um, Villanova's campus in the middle of the day, and they can look up to the sky. Oh, the third sun has finally come out, and you're like, wait, wait, what, what? <laughs> right? And so it takes the familiar but renders it cognitively estranged, um, and that's the way I think of kind of. You know, it teaches us the skill of um, how to interpret landscapes, right, that are unfamiliar to us. Um, it kind of jolts us out of this, out of the habits that we have um, of, um, you know, familiarity and assuming that the future, um, you know, will look particular types of ways. So I think that's more of a skill of the imagination and how to navigate sort of unfil unfamiliar terrain. Um, and then the third I'll talk about is the skill of empathy, right, which is a goal of a lot of literature, right, to get us to think about um, people's lived experiences in a more intimate and complex way um, so that we or readers are kind of habituated into feeling different ranges of emotions, um, whether it is, you know, fear or concern for a character's future or joy at seeing um, sort of their achievements, right, um, at the end of their exploits. And so, I think that um, those are a number of different um, skills that, that readers can take from speculative fiction, whether it's apocalyptic or you know, the more hopeful types of, of speculative fiction. I'm, I'm going to end my, uh, my comments and then open it up to the uh, audience. But the, the point I'd like to hear you speak to is, is and I think we see this in, in all of your presentations, is the idea that speculative fiction in many ways dwells on the agency of the subjects of the pieces of work. And so how, how should we understand that? What does that tell us about, well, what does that tell us about, about the fact that um, at one point in time this kind of fiction was seen as juvenile at the very best and now it is something that we well, we tout on college and university campuses. So how, how do we understand that agency and then the disparity between the way in which the genre is received or has been received? I guess I just wanted to, to follow up on what Patricia was just saying, which is the other thing I would say about Octavia Butler is what a profound work of philosophy I find. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Parable of the Sower. Mm -hmm. I mean, that book has probably changed my thinking about the world more than almost any other book I've ever read because of this idea of change you know, that the change is God or change is the one thing we can absolutely believe in. And I find that terrifying, and especially when I first read that book, I was yeah. so counter to who I am as a person. But she's totally right. Um, that change is the one thing you just have to know to believe in profoundly mm -hmm. is the reality we live in. And, um, you know, that empowers the characters in that book in all kinds of ways. Um, it doesn't sound like something that would be empowering necessarily because so often you can feel like you're the object of change rather than the subject of it. But it's just, it's, it was such a, such a remarkable, evolved articulation of that idea in that, in that work in particular. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a member of her, relig her religion, basically, you know. Earth seat. <laughs> and Earth seat uh, at this point. I'll like extend that to the sequel to Parable of the Sower, Parable of the Talents, because that's a book that I think talking about, you know, God as change, that's a book that invites us to imagine a way out of this feeling of impossibility that's given to us in a country where the state is governed by um, slavery era documents like the Constitution, because it's a, it's a novel where the extension of Parable of the Sower People are imagining new forms of, of statehood, new forms of governmentality that are completely separate from the way that the United States is currently configured and put together. And I think that kind of invitation to think otherwise than so frequently we currently limit ourselves is, is incredibly valuable. And I wanted to clarify, Dr. Kada, because I mean, part of the ambition of speculative fiction as a label um, is precisely to sort of share the, the quote unquote taint, if you will, of science fiction, um, to be a, a genre um, that is for more uh, learned audiences um, who like to have more complex storylines um, and a genre that's not as concerned with, being, with commercial success.
um, as it's science, uh, social, uh, as um, science fiction, the pulp fiction particularly of the 1950s, um, as well as to distinguish it from sci-fi, which is the more filmic and TV representations of um, futuristic speculation. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so from the outgo, you have, um, according to people like Ryder and his What is SF, this idea that academics, college students, they are going to read speculative fiction and it will indeed be taken up by them. And so of course, there's a lot of um, cultural capital and social capital behind that, right? Um, and certain writers get taken up, others do not, based on a whole range of factors, um, including things like race and gender. So I just wanted to clarify that. And um, I think this speaks to agency both on the part of um, the writers as well as the, the characters that they write about because as writer would tell us, um, genres are acts, not facts, right? So they're not a certain list of qualities that one goes to a text and find. Um, but actually, um, readers, writers, publishers, and other such entities come to what he calls a generic contract, right? They decide upon, okay, as in the case of speculative fiction, we want to create a genre um, that is more you know, for the more sophisticated reader, um, that has more complex storylines, et cetera, et cetera. And it is in that sort of um, that covenant that we get speculative fiction. And I think that we see the agency um, really translate into uh, the characters themselves um, because they're not constrained by cer certain formulaic tropes that people would expect of science fiction. And so um, the range of actions and possibilities for the, these characters tends to be much greater than we might find in sort of the science fiction of the pulp era. Um, and um, that agency, I think, um, it's predicated in the fact that though we can't change the past and we may be deeply constrained by our present, that the future is not necessarily predetermined. So I'll just end on that. One more quick note. I think that in our contemporary moment, Speculative fiction is one of the areas where this distinction between what an educated audience reads and what, say, a high school educated audience reads really breaks down. Right. And, and the, the distinctions between kind of pulp and cheaper right. forms of production and more kind of you know, expensive forms of production breaks down. I first encountered the works of Nalo Hopkinson mm -hmm. in mass market you know, paperback copies with small print and lots of words on the page. Um, that were super cheaply made and cost $3.95. Right. Um, and I think one of the things that happens in speculative fiction is that it gets this democracy of audience mm -hmm. and really transcends the sort of limitations that literary fiction might assume um, with its with its kind of audience. And the making into TV shows and movies, yeah. like with um, Octav Octavia Butler's Kindred. I think Nalo Hopkinson's Who Fears Death, HBO is trying to do a series on that. So yeah, so the, the divisions don't break down even if the um, context in which the genre originally emerges seem to be rigid. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I want to go to the democracy of audience <laughs> and uh, ask if there are Questions, comments. Wait, there's a there's one right there in the back. I love it all um, automatically. Yes. Hi, Messiah. <laughs> one of my students from Rasinus. Great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, there we go. So when I was listening to this talk, thank you, by the way, for this panel, just thinking about like with the recent like rapid advances in like technology and how that's obviously like informed the genre. I mean, we talked about with Afrofuturism and how that like leans heavily on technology, especially like looking at like common exa example, like Black Panther and like the technology beyond belief, like with Wakanda. And then, like, with the climate change stories and, like, how we see, like, a clear respect for science within those. So, like, what does technology, like, say to speculative fiction in terms of, like, what it acts as genre today? We were talking about this message of hope, the bird, all of that. But then also just, I suppose, general ways that it allows for, like, new creativity and, like, expression within the genre. Yeah. So I can answer really briefly. One of the really interesting things about Blake is Martin Delaney wrote it in part in response to the Fugitive Slave Act, but he also wrote it in part in response to being enrolled in Harvard's medical school for the first year. And then after that first year, Harvard decided 
that the presence of black students in its medical school was too offensive to its white students. Mm -hmm. And so it kicked out Delaney and the two other black male students who are currently enrolled in the medical school. And so I think one of the things that we see in relationship to science and technology in speculative fiction um, is a, a kind of movement of science and technology away from the, um, the, the purview of the few and away from these sort of elite institutions. And it gets sort of distributed more broadly, especially in this novel, Blake, into literally the huts of America. And that's where in a kind of fugitive scientific experiments, um, we see all kinds of innovations. And Delaney himself was known um, before writing this novel as a scientist. He published in scientific journals about comets, about the stars, um, and, and he was also known as like a, a very sort of um, established medical practitioner um, in, in his own right, um, even without you know, the Harvard degree. Yeah, I guess I have two thoughts about that. I, I mentioned Kim Stanley Robinson. I mean, he's literally invited to climate conferences in Europe and elsewhere. You know, scientists worship him at this point. Um, <laughs> although he's not always right. In the Ministry for the Future, he was sure cryptocurrency was an amazing part of it. <laughs> so that was a little bit of a fail. But, um, you know, so there's that dimension where some of these writers are really interested in geoengineering, seeding the atmosphere. I mean, they're all in on solving these problems through really, frankly, scary technology, but the other option is scary too. The other thing I see, though, that is interesting is a kind of tension between those kinds of narratives and a growing kind of genre of almost domestic apocalyptic fiction about how individual families are experiencing the anxiety around climate change. And in a lot of those, the, the real question is what can individuals do when it isn't about seeding the atmosphere, right? You or I are probably not going to be doing that. It's like, does recycling matter? Does not driving matter? Does not flying matter? You know, does not wasting water matter? Um, and often there's a divide in those narratives um, between some characters who believe that individuals have power and some others who are like, it's all the state, it's all the big corporations, they have to solve it. You're being lied to if you think driving less matters. Or in other words, there's, there is a kind of version of that even in the progressive camp that says, that's just a lie told. Even the, the idea of carbon footprint, you might have heard, like I've heard the idea that's like a myth created by um, the oil industry because really, you don't really have a carbon footprint. It's a way of deflecting blame from these big organizations. I personally don't buy that. It might be true, but I also don't buy that we don't have a carbon footprint. So uh, that's a long answer. But I just I think there's there's tension there between what we are non-scientists can do and those others. Well, technology absolutely is shaping how writers write, <laughs> um, as well as how artists um, do their art. Um, I don't know if you've seen Twitter novels before. Some writers take to Twitter and they do threads of like that constitute a novel <laughs> at the end of it. Um, I think that um, as well, since you mentioned Black Panther, if we think about movies, TV shows, as well as graphic novels, I think that they can um, give us speculative fiction in a way that's much more visually compelling. Um, and if we're thinking.